Amen. Kia ora, Bryce. Nga mihi o te, um, o te aranga. Uh, happy, happy Easter to you all. Uh, really good to be here. And this is like a really, you know, the pivotal day on the Christian calendar, um, Easter Sunday. And um, as we've been going through over these talks over the last few days, we've been looking back, looking around, and today um, looking forward. But all this uh, looking is all based on this what we are here to celebrate, you know, the resurrection of Jesus, the new life um, that he's breathing in uh, to, to his creation, the creation being reborn, as we talked about on Friday. And, um, and that's something that we want to be able to pass on. You know, we want the next generation and the generation after that to really um, know that life-changing, transformative resurrection power in their lives um, and in this country. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about today. But I want to start off with a bit of a point of clarification, which I know is not the punchiest way to begin. Um, but I thought it was worth it because yesterday after my talk, I was asked a very good question and I wondered if perhaps I'd been a little unclear and I wanted to um, kind of clarify something. So the question was, did I think in light of what I'd said about um, seeking shalom and not sort of obsessing over top down sort of power, you know, political power and that kind of thing, that I thought maybe um, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics? And it's a good question because there have been groups of Christians and whole denominations and so on that have said Christians shouldn't be involved in politics because it tends to corrupt. You know, you get power and then power corrupts you. Um, but I, I don't agree with that. I think Christians should be involved in politics and that we should have Christians and um, involved in all the political parties and probably across the spectrum. Um, and in fact, I think we should have Christians in all spheres of life. Um, so I guess my point is one that's a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more about balance or where our emphasis is, is that if our sort of strategy and is to, or sort of number one strategy is to go to Wellington, go to the Beehive and sort of um, take over in whatever form that might look like, then I don't think that's really the, the, the right strategy. It's not to say that we shouldn't have Christians doing that. It's not to say that when we have Christians in positions of influence and power that we shouldn't celebrate that and support them and um, encourage them and all that kind of thing. It's just simply to say that we shouldn't put all our eggs or even our main eggs in that basket. Um, and I think part of it is because... Um, there is some element of truth that, you know, that power can be kind of corrupting. Um, it's not to say that in an absolute sense, but just like I said, that, we, you know, we've seen it abroad, that that, that kind of approach can turn kind of quite um, nasty, for want of a better word. Um, and I think if we're going to be really Jesus-like and about how we engage with culture, um, then surprise, surprise, we should probably take our lesson from Jesus. And um, there's, a, there's this little story in, in Matthew 20 where... Um, uh, James and John's mum goes to Jesus and says, hey, um, when you come into your glory, when you come into your kingdom, can one of my sons be on one side and one of your sons be on the other side? In other words, can they kind of be your like, right and left-hand men? Can, she's, she and they are sort of like got their, their names and lights. You know, they go, oh, Jesus is going to be like the king and my boys, they're going to be right there with him. You know, it's going to be like fame and fortune, that sort of thinking. And... Um, and he says, you don't know what you're asking. Um, and she doesn't know what he, he, she's asking because who was on Jesus' left and right when he, when he came into his kingdom? It was the two on the cross, wasn't it, on either side. The kind of kingdom that he was ushering in, wasn't, it wasn't glory, right? In and, and the normal sense of what we think about, it was sacrifice and painful. And so what his, uh, their mother was asking was um, more than she, they would have been bargaining for. And anyway, the disciples get a bit disgruntled about it, and he calls them together, and he says... You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the way Jesus understands power is in, in service of others. And so I think that kind of has to be our main MO. And um, even if somebody finds himself Prime Minister of New Zealand and they're a Jesus follower, that way of leading their use of power ideally will still look like this, even in that position of influence. You know, there'll still be being a servant, even in the position of power. So that's just kind of my little like, I totally think Christians should be involved in politics. Um, I just don't think that's where we put all the emphasis. And the other thing I want to say is I'm just, uh, one of my big 
hobby horses is Christians should be involved in every part of life and every job. Um, it's no, there's no such thing as like a, a secular job for a Christian. Every job is spiritual. Every job is potentially ministry. There's none of this putting like missionaries and pastors on a pedestal and the rest sort of like, well, you just earn money for the church. You know, um, I think that's based on a really faulty theology. I think Christians need to be in every sphere of life, including politics and, um, you know, being janitors and teaching kids and being doctors and nurses and um, retail clerks and all the rest. Okay, cool. Um, enough of that. Let's get into today. So looking forward, well, I want to ask the question today, what makes faith stick? Looking back, we were talking about the good news that we're here to celebrate this weekend, the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and the fact that in a world of bad news, that really is good news. The good news about a vaccine, that's just, that's just a scratch. That's just a taste of the really good news, right, which is the eternal life that we enjoy in Jesus. And so We've got this great news, and now when we look around, we find ourselves in a position where we maybe uh, feel like almost like we're in exile, like we're no, no longer quite so at home. But instead of getting all defensive and engaging in culture war, we want to go about the business of seeking shalom, and seeking shalom for this country and, and this place. And today I just want to zoom in on a quite a specific kind of thing, and which is uh, how does we make faith stick as we pass on and model faith to subsequent generations. This is a lady called Ashley Bogle. She's not famous, um, but here she is. She graduated from university, and she's the first person in her family, it, perhaps ever, as far as anyone knows, to have gone and graduated to from, gone to university and graduated there. Uh, and that's because it's kind of totally against her family culture. She's part of a notorious family, the Bogle family, who are. Um, a multi-generational crime family in the United States. Um, there's a guy with the fantastic name of Fox Butterfield um, who wrote a book about, about their family. It's called In My Father's House. Um, in this book, he's writing about how crime spans family genera- or multi-generations within families. He, he points out that 50% of crime in the United States is committed by just 5% of families. And um, two-thirds of crime in the States is committed by 10% um, of families. So crime is a kind of multi-generational family phenomenon in many ways. And this particular book tra- tracks the Bogle family. And one of the, um, for, from beginning after the Civil War, by the way, so it goes quite a way back, um, but one of the kind of patriarchs of this family is a guy called Rooster Bogle. Um, and um, probably Leonard's birth name, but who knows? And um, he used to drive past the state prison with his little boys and say, take a good look here, sons, because one day this will be your home. Um, And it wasn't so much a statement of fact. It was more like a challenge. He was laying down uh, a challenge to his his boys. Um, And he modeled being a criminal. Um, So being a criminal in that family in the Boggles um, was what you aspired to. That was what a good Boggle did. At least 66 members of this family have been imprisoned. Um, this is just a small sort of family tree of the, the Boggles um, and various crimes I've committed and so on. So, I mean, this kind of illustrates the power of a family culture. And I guess in some ways today I want to talk about family culture. But I don't want to talk about it in the narrow sense of just you and your nuclear family, you and your own set of kids that live under the same roof, perhaps. But family in a slightly more broader sense sort of Fano, uh, your close friends, uh, extended family, church community. That's the sort of thing I want us to be talking about. And I think it's important for us to talk about it because I think in many ways as we find ourselves in an increasingly secularized culture, the importance of handing it on faith to the next generation is perhaps uh, more important now than ever before. I mean, just think about what it might have been like to be in the Middle Ages. Say, let's just say medieval, late medieval England. Uh, God was everywhere around you, the Christian God. Uh, each week you had to attend church. And the church building that you went to would have been the most impressive building in town. It would have been nothing like it. I mean, absolutely jaw-dropping to the point where we still go and visit these, these churches today, don't we? Um, but it would have been utterly um, dwarfing everything else. 
uh, you have contact with relatively, uh, a relatively small number of people and you never really go very far past your village. So the people that you interact with are pretty much like you, see the world the same way. So any other way of seeing reality would have seemed very distant and unlikely. Um, you perhaps didn't own your own Bible. Um, you might have even been illiterate. Uh, and so you relied on the clergy down at the local church to read the Bible to you and to explain it to you. And um, their knowledge about these mysterious topics would have given them a sense of real authority that was just way more um, reliable than anything you could kind of dream up on your own when you're raking mud on your peasant farm or whatever. Um, death surrounds you. You know, um, you might have had several siblings die in infancy. Um, and so the question of death and what happens after death is an ever-present one. Even as you look up into the night sky, you believe that the earth is at the center of the cosmos. Um, so it gives creation a sense of order and humanity a real sense of meaning and purpose. Now, of course, as always, there were people that were really devout in their faith and others that weren't, but everyone was sort of more or less on this kind of spectrum. I mean, there was really only one game in town when it came to religious faith. Now, fast forward to the present day. Public life largely operates without reference to God. Um, belief in God is something you do in private. You sort of like keep it at home. Don't bring it to work. Certainly don't bring it to politics and that kind of thing is sometimes the, the attitude. Um, going to church is an option and, and one that most people forego in New Zealand. Um, these people would rather go to a mall probably or go fishing or something like that. Um, and, you know, everything's open on a Sunday. Um, and those buildings and, and events and all that sort of thing are far bigger and more exciting and, and that sort of thing than anything that you might find in your average church building on a Sunday. Um, we travel the world and the world travels to us, so we're rubbing shoulders with people with very different kinds of worldviews, very different faiths, often no faith at all in a sense. And we read all sorts of different perspectives and are forced to entertain lots of different outlooks. We see Earth as just one insignificant rock um, of countless others and orbiting around a sun that will one day be extinguished, apparently, and is just one of a galaxy among virtually an infinite number of galaxies. It makes us feel a bit small. In this kind of environment, all faith is fragilized. By fragilized, I mean made, made fragile. And I say all faith because I don't just mean Christian faith, and I don't even really just mean religious faith. I think even the faith of an atheist is somewhat fragile too, because we are, as one famous writer called Charles Taylor put it, living in a, in a cross-pressured kind of world. What he means by that is that when people look at the stars or when they hold a newborn baby, they do still feel a sense of awe, and they maybe wonder, what, is there something more? Life feels kind of meaningful, and so on the one hand, there's something pressuring us towards some faith in God or a gods or a set of gods, I should say, or what have you, depending on the kind of religious context that you're in. And then on the other hand, we're just not sure. There's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics to modern life that make us unsure about ourselves, and so we live cr these crush pressured lives. And so everyone kind of has a fragile face to some degree. Now, of course, individual differences in personality and growth and all that kind of thing, but they're just talking in very broad broad terms, and I just paint this picture to say that in a, fa in a community, sorry, in a culture where faith is fragilized, then handing on faith is just that much more difficult, because there was once upon a time where everything around you just reinforced Jesus as king, and now there's a lot of competing ideas, and that idea about King Jesus, who rose again on this day that we're celebrating today, is just one of a number of different ideas that are out there. And sometimes it's not, and in fact, we're probably, if we're honest, saying it's not the most prevalent idea in our own culture. And so then passing it on to our kids and to the next generation within our church um, is not that easy. It's important, right? Because without passing it on, the church is likely to shrivel up. It's not to say that people won't come to faith, but it's likely to, to decline. Um, but it is getting harder. And so I think it's something we really need to take, um, take quite seriously. I want us to look at um, a passage in Deuteronomy. So if you're following on in your Bible, have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, very famous passage, key passage for uh, Jewish people. One of the um, interesting things about Judaism 
Old Testament Judaism was it wasn't really a missionary faith. I mean, there were exceptions, and certainly Israel was meant to be like a beacon that would shine and that the nations would be drawn to and as a result glorify Yahweh. But it wasn't like they were ne- like on a, on a kind of mission like we normally think of, going out to the other nations and spreading the word. It wasn't a missionary faith in that sense. Um, you could become part of the people of Israel, um, but it was kind of a difficult process and it wasn't something that they generally um, actively went about seeking. So the main way of continuing on this faith in Yahweh was by handing it on to the next generation. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And that's not Psalm 137, by the way. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's like the problem with doing PowerPoints late at night and you kind of forget stuff. Um, Busted. All right. So this idea here is really key. I mean, this is really the central, in many ways, a central text, I should say, um, for people of a Jewish faith. I mean, every morning they pray the Shema, which is this, this part here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's the most important prayer in Judaism. And this passage is, uh, is so central. You'll recognize, too, this part here, the commandment to love God with your whole being, as Jesus' um, answer to the question of what's the greatest commandment. Um, and so this is really central. And right here, right alongside this most important prayer and the, the greatest commandment, is the command also to teach and impress these commandments on your children. And we get a really interesting picture here of tying them as symbols on your head and on your hands and writing them on the door frames and that kind of thing. And um, Jewish believers uh, take this quite literally. So conservative Jews or Orthodox Jews um, will, um, for morning prayers on weekdays, wear these phylacteries, um, which are around the head. You can see there it's on his forehead, one here on his arm, and these contain um, scriptures, commandments from the first five books of the Bible, Torah. Um, this is here is called a mezuzah, and um, I remember seeing these for sale in the lo- in the in the um, Jewish quarter of a- in LA. Just go into a shop and you could buy a mezuzah, which is like this thing that you stick on the doorpost with scriptures rolled up inside. It's a like very literal way of binding these things to your body and writing them on the doorposts. Now most of us don't do that, but we understand what it's really trying to convey in a more general sense, right, is that this stuff needs to be woven into your ordinary life. It's not just something that you do for one hour on a Sunday, but it's something that you, you weave into the natural kind of rhythms of your family life. That's an important part of passing on faith. And I want to say that I'm no expert. I mean, as you know, I'm, uh, I've got little kids. We sang happy birthday to my four-year-old yesterday. So I'm only a few years down the track. And I'm at a stage with my kids where they just take everything I say as, as gospel truth, right? They're not, like, questioning Jesus and God and that kind of thing. My oldest one, I'm sure, you know, he's starting to have those curly questions. But they still basically are kind of going along with what I say. And um, I haven't walked that path, you know, when where kids turn into adults and start thinking for themselves. And so I'm not setting myself up as someone who's walked this path and, and, and figured it all out, as if anyone could anyway. Um, but just simply want to share with you some thoughts, reflections, some material that I've read and, and research and so on that I found kind of helpful. But I also want to give you a chance toward the end maybe to just offer some suggestions as well. So I want you to be thinking as I talk a little bit about what do you, what have you done or what have you seen done or what are you thinking of doing in terms of trying to foster faith in um, the younger generations or next generation and so on. Uh, one thing also uh, I want to um, point out is that Although I'm not an expert, um, I like to read the experts. And there's one guy who's written a really interesting study, a New Zealand theologian called Kevin Ward. And he wrote, um, this was about 20 years ago, so you know things have changed even since then. But 20 years ago, he wrote uh, a study on, or did a study on, 
why the mainline denominations in New Zealand have declined. And my, my, by mainline, we're talking uh, Presbyterian, Anglican, Methodist. And they're generally, towards the end of the 20th century, had declined in numbers. And he, and he did a big investigation into that. And he really just put, boiled it down to one thing. And he said that there's one generation of mainline Christians that just didn't hand on faith successfully to the next one. And he has a whole bunch of reasons. And at that stage, writing about the year 2000, he points to uh, evangelical churches as having done a better job of it. Um, even now, that maybe is, is uh, maybe evangelical churches are struggling. But at that time, he was saying, look, evangelical churches have done this well, but mainline churches have not. There was one generation that failed to pass it on. And as a result, um, those churches were shrinking in numbers. And so I think it's just something we need to think about in terms of a mission field. You know, we think about the mission field um, out, as being out there. And, you know, even when we're talking about being in exile and so on, we're thinking about living such good lives among the pagans out there, right, that, that um, we would reflect Jesus well to them. But we also need to think of the mission field, as, in a sense, as in here too, um, to each other and to subsequent generations. So I want to talk about this question, what makes faith stick? And like I said, I'm no expert, so I haven't figured this out, but there have been some people that have done research into this. Um, there's an institute in the States called Fuller Youth Institute, and they did a study in uh, young adults. So adults transitioning from uh, high school into university age. They tracked 500 adults over a three-year period. These were all uh, Christians, uh, youth who identified as Christians and then went off to uni and they tracked them for three years and saw that, found that about 50% of them by the end of that three years would say, yeah, I'm a Christian and the other 50% had kind of drifted away. And this, these sort of numbers sort of square with wider society, at least in the States, which is probably similar, maybe not exactly the same, but probably a similar kind of phenomenon here in New Zealand. And then they looked at those 50% that did where faith did stick, so to speak. And they called this the Sticky Faith Initiative. Um, and they tried to identify what were the common factors or the most important factors in, that made faith stick for that half of the group. And they found that the number one thing was intergenerational relationships within the church. And this is a little bit counterintuitive, maybe. Um, maybe even goes against the grain of, of some sort of models of youth ministry. I remember going to a very famous mega church in the States, and um, not a church that I want to criticize or anything like that, um, do a lot of good stuff. Um, but just interesting, like when you, get, when you arrive on a Sunday morning, before you even really step inside the gate, teenagers are then kind of herded off and sent to this amazing facility just for youth over there. They have their own, as you can imagine, um, sort of dazzling kind of uh, church service just for youth. Um, and then everyone else, the adults, all go off to another building. And, and uh, a lot of other churches, smaller churches, aspire to be like that, right? We want to have great growing youth ministries, and sometimes the bigger they get, the more siloed they become from the rest of church. Um, and I think it's really important to have youth-specific stuff, but this research also shows the importance of making sure that they're not completely segregated and that there are intergenerational relationships. Because the relationships at, uh, of, among peers can be fantastic, but those aren't really what are going to sustain faith in the long run. It's actually the relationships they're going to have with the next generation or the two generations up from them. That is the number one thing that makes faith stick. And this is, um, I think, really important for us to think about when we get beyond those years, you know, and that's me thinking about, okay, so what role am I playing in the younger people's lives in my church? And of course, we're all at different stages of life. So younger people might actually be middle-aged for some people. You know, it's not that it, this is, we're just talking about teenagers here. Um, but we should be thinking about how are we fostering faith and trying to encourage the people uh, that are coming behind us. The same Sticky Faith initiative found or settled on what they call the five to one ratio. And I'm not sure how they worked this out, but from their re research, they discovered that they think that each teenager should have five adults investing in them. And one thing I think is so significant about this is that it means that we need way more than just parents investing in their own kids. That's why I say that when we talk about family here today, we're not just talking about your own little nuclear family. Um, and we're not just talking about married people. 
I've got a friend who wrote a book called Breaking the Marriage Idol, and I love that title because we do in evangelicalism sometimes uh, really hold up marriage as a kind of an idol in some sense because we uh, just assume that all Christians should get married, forgetting, of course, that Jesus was single, um, had no kids. Paul was single, and as far as we know, had no kids. Uh, And Paul argued that being single was better um, in terms of following Christ. Um, And yet somehow we forget that, and we just kind of assume that, you know, we, we, people are called to get married, and not all people are. There are people that are single. Not everyone um, has children, um, and yet everyone has an important role to play in fostering faith in the next generation, because it's not just uh, one or two adults investing in each teenager. It's, it's like five, you know, and that means, yeah, you need to be investing in your own kids, but we also need surrogates, you know, uncles and aunties and, and pretend grandparents and all that sort of thing, or real grandparents. But, you know, lots of people, all hands on deck, really pouring into the next generation. It doesn't necessarily have to be official mentoring or any of that kind of, st- kind of thing, but just taking a real interest in, and perhaps intentionally trying to nurture faith in the subsequent generations. And everyone has a role to play in this, in this task, whether they're your own kids or not. You may have kids yourself, and you've still got a task to do for other people's kids as well. I want to also share just some research, a totally different set of research, but something that I found really personally encouraging um, when I had, well, I have little kids still, but when I had my first son, I don't know, I'm possibly alone in this, but I had this feeling that maybe I was brainwashing my kids by talking about Jesus with them. Like, I'd do it, but I'd sort of, Back in, back in my mind, I would sort of wonder, like, am I just sort of indoctrinating them? You know, am I, I, I wanted them to be able to, you know, I don't know, think for themselves, and am I just kind of, I don't know. So, I don't know. You're probably getting a, a, a bit of bit too much information about my doubts and things that I think. But, um, you know, that, and, and also, you know, like I spend a bit of time in, a, in academia and, you know, that's how academics think a lot of time, right? And there is this idea that exists that the only reason that kids grow up being religious or growing up and believing in God or gods or what have you is because their parents brainwash them into thinking that. And if you just left a kid to their own devices, you didn't really like try to inculcate this belief into them, then they'd all just kind of naturally be atheists. That's how, that's how humans work. This is this idea out there. But there's this psychologist called Justin Barrett. He is a Christian, but he's just a respected psychologist um, in the mainstream of psychology. And he has written a book called Born Believers. And this book talks about, he really argues the opposite. And he says, children are born believers. They are naturally wired, psychologically wired, to believe in, not in like the Christian God, so to speak. It's not like they come out of the womb and know the um, Nicene Creed or be able to recite, you know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity or something very like, like that. But, but they come out with a tendency to believe in sort of gods or a god or some kind of supernatural realm, that kind of thing. And he talks about the, the psychological processes that make that possible. For example, the, um, the tendency that children have, a sort of hyperactive tendency to look for agents behind anything. In other words, um, beings or creatures or something with a will um, must have made that happen. Things don't, for kids don't just have, sort of happen accidentally. That's why kids are so freaked out when they hear like the branches scraping across the, the window at night or what have you, you know, the things that go bump. Because it's like, it's not just, oh, well, that's just the wind. It's like, no, something's shaking the tree, like a being or something like that. Because they have a tendency to look for agents that cause things to happen. Um, and so that naturally opens children up to the possibility of their being God or a God, um, gods, whatever. Another example is that they tend to look for, children have a preference, a pronounced preference for explanations that turn on an object's purpose, not its origin. So what we mean by that is, or what Barrett means by that, is that, uh, you, you, I don't know, a child might say, uh, why is there a sun? As in, in the sky. And there's a couple of ways you can explain that. You can explain it and say, well, you know, the sun is a massive incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. If anyone is a fan of They Might Be Giants, you might be able to sing along with me. (laughs) Thanks, Greg. Um, You could give a scientific explanation. Or you could sort of say, what is the sun for? Well, the sun 
makes life happen on our planet. You know, it helps plants to grow. It gives us the vitamins we need. It gives us what we need to nourish ourselves and to be able to live and um, to be happy and all that kind of thing. And so there's two different ways. One way is to explain where it comes from, the origin. Another is it to explain the, the purpose. And children have a pronounced preference for that purpose kind of explanation. I think both are good, by the way. Um, but, but children, again, are wired to think, what is the point here? What is the purpose? And that, again, opens them up to belief in God. And there are a whole lot of sorts of things that he lists. And he says, these are not, yes, they are something that we have from childhood, but they are not childish. These are just normal, natural, healthy ways of functioning as humans. And actually, it's the children, uh, sorry, the parents that try to raise their children to not believe in God that usually takes a bit longer to in, in, um, pass on that belief. And children are not, he also points out, children are not as um, susceptible, I guess, to being indoctrinated as we might assume. And um, I think an example of this is trying to get your kids to eat Brussels sprouts. Like, you can, you can try and brainwash them into the virtues of it, but it takes them a long while to appreciate a bowl of Brussels sprouts, right? And, and so it's just not as easy as we might think, but kids are naturally wired to believe in something more. And this is how Barrett puts it. Belief in gods of some sort or other, and maybe a supreme capital G god in particular, may be largely natural in this sense. Biology plus ordinary environment, no special cultural conditions required. In other words, you don't need to raise a kid in some sort of like um, brainwashing type cult in order for them to inherit faith. This is how they are wired. And the reason why I took so much encouragement from this is because it just reminded me, or I guess affirmed for me, that speaking about faith with your kids is their natural language. This is how they think and speak. And yes, of course, the way they articulate things is going to be different, and the way we articulate things to them is going to be different. But you're going with the grain of how they're wired when you talk about faith in God. Just kind of um, thinking about along very similar lines, I think it's helpful for us to look at a little bit about spiritual development and how we develop spiritually. Now, this is not something that applies to everyone, but this kind of model, definitely I can see it in my own life, and I think it'll resonate with a lot of you. Um, and it goes like this. And there are lots of variations on this out there, and they use different words and so on, so this is just one example. But the first stage of spiritual development is order. And the characteristic of order is naivety. Not in a negative sense, but just in a kind of neutral sense. Just kind of accepting stuff. And an example is good things happen to good people. The next stage is disorder. And this is characterized by doubt. Things get more complicated. You um, fall in love with somebody who's not a Christian, or your best friend is not a Christian and they're a better person than you. Your sibling comes out as gay and you're not sure what you think about that anymore. These kinds of things make life more complex. The um, example, why do bad things happen to good people? So suddenly realizing life's not quite as easy as good things happen to good people, and, and it's not just sort of maths anymore. You know, life is messy, and, and that creates kind of doubt in the stage's disorder. And then there's another stage. I think some people get stuck here or... Uh, perhaps lose their faith at this point. This is where that sort of sticky faith stuff becomes really important. And I want to talk about doubt in a moment. But the next stage is reorder. And the ne uh, it's characterized by trust. It's not the same as naivety. It's not just hitting the rewind button and going back to naivety. But it's a sort of a settling on some foundational stuff. And so an example would be, I trust that God is good and just. Yes, there's stuff that I don't get. Yes, life is messy. I don't have perfect answers for everything, but there's been some stuff that's happened in my life and in my heart that have helped me to land with a very strong conviction that God is good and just. And, and then it kind of it sort of settles some of that disorder. But it's not going back to just the good old days when, you're, when everything was kind of black and white. It's kind of a maturing. Now, I was listening to a podcast with uh, quite a well-known, um, quite a liberal kind of thinker, kind of guy that would freak a lot of people out, but um, has some good stuff to say, even though I haven't read a lot of his stuff. And he was talking about this, and he made a really interesting observation. So this guy's not an ev he's Christian, but he's not an evangelical Christian. He'd be more sort of at the progressive end. And um, 
He said, you know, evangelicals, he's noticed, are very good at the order stage. And I think we look around at like this place and you go, man, we're pretty good at this. You know, like kids programs, youth ministry, like there's just so much exciting stuff going on in a lot of churches for young people, you know, children and teenagers and so on. I recently bought a book um, that was being sold at my church. Uh, it, was a, it was a Bible. It's called the Etherlight Bible, and it's put run to, by the put together by the Bible Society. I bought this for my son because he was super excited about it because it matches with an app that's like a video game, and it kind of ties in with the Bible. And I'm like, I mean, we have really like <laughs> evangelicals have really taken that sort of trying to get that order stage right to kind of the next level, um, and so it's that stage where we've got a lot of practice. But this stage. He, this is going back to the same thinker. He said, uh, this is where evangelicals are not as strong. What happens when your 18, 19, 20-year-old, maybe younger than that, starts asking the big questions, the tough questions that don't have really nice, neat answers? Well, sometimes what happens is we try to stamp it out. We try to just give these very pat kind of answers that we pretend just wrap everything up in a nice little bow. And they're not convinced. But what we have conveyed to them is you can't ask that question. It's too dangerous. We're saying, my faith is a house of cards, and if you ask too many of these questions, take too many cards out, it's going to collapse. So just don't say it. You know, we create a, a sort of a stigma around doubt and expressing doubt. And one of the big findings of the Sticky Faith Initiative up there with the, sort of in the top four reasons that, of what makes, makes faith stick is environments that where doubt is okay, safe environments for young people to express doubt, that actually counterintuitively helps make faith stick. We naturally think, no, we have to stamp it out, but we don't. The research says we don't have to do that. Actually, the opposite is true. So Cara Powell, who is the mastermind behind the Sticky Faith Initiative, although she has a lot of people that have been helping her do the research, she says, doubt's not the enemy of faith, silence is. And sometimes we create um, cultures of silence around the tough questions. And that's not healthy and helpful for passing on faith to the next generation. So we need to be better at this um, disorder stage, right? Dealing with and honoring these questions and saying, that's a great question that I've got a few ideas about, but no beautiful answers, nothing perfect. But let's talk about it keep praying about it, thinking about it, reading books about it, chatting about it, journeying with it, you know, and, 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 and letting it be and honoring that in that way. I want us just to take a moment now um, to kind of share our collective wisdom on this. Um, and so let me just see how I'm doing for time because, okay, not great. <laughs> so I just want to... Um, Give you a moment uh, for a couple of minutes. Just find the kind of cluster around you. So two, three people, whatever's kind of natural where you're sitting, and just talk about um, what has kind of what have you done in your own families, or what have you observed in other families, or what would you like to implement um, that you think is maybe quite helpful in trying to model faith for the next generation. And it may not be in your own little household. It might be in kids ministries at church or what have you. Just take a couple of minutes to do that, and then I'll kind of draw us all back together and finish things off. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'd love to hear more, but just continue those conversations in your communities and share ideas because we're all in this together, five to one, right? It's not just mum and dad or, or mum or whatever your family situation is. It's, um, it's, it's everyone on board and all the uncles and aunties and friends and all that kind of thing. Hey, so what I want to do to end is I just want to end on a prayer for, for the next generation. Uh, this is an Anglican prayer. Um, and so I'm going to read it. And as we pray, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just take a moment to picture, if you have kids, picture your kids. If you don't have kids, maybe picture some kids that you know particularly well. And also start to picture other kids within your church community. Could be friends' kids. Could be enemies' kids, I guess, within, <laughs> within your church. Just the kids. Um, the kids that really annoy you. Yep, those two. Um, Keep those kids in mind as I pray this prayer and we finish. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you've blessed our congregations with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom 
as we bring them up in the faith that they might, might never know a day apart from you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.